Welcome back to the garage, everyone, where we're continuing work on my 1989 BMW 325i E30. Now, unfortunately, we're still stuck in the middle of winter here, and the weather hasn't really improved since the last video, so the car has been regulated to garage duty. However, this means it gives me perfect opportunity to start working on the interior of this car. The interior needs a lot of work. Everything from the seats to the dashboard to the steering wheel is just in very poor condition. So in the past few days, I actually picked up a new piece that will certainly enhance the interior of this car. Let's go take a look at it. Ta-da! That's right, we have a brand new dashboard over here. Well, okay, so it's not actually a brand new dashboard. It is secondhand. I picked this up locally out of a car that apparently didn't see much sunlight because it is not cracked. It's not even weathered hardly at all. Now, I think I got this for a pretty good deal. It was $175 and it was, again, local. I didn't even have to drive that far to get it. Sometimes the parts you need the most are just in your backyard. So I'm very fortunate to have found this. And if we look at it, we can see that, you know, in the typical spots where we normally have cracking, just right through here and through here, it's actually in very good shape overall definitely better than the one that's currently in the car let's go take a look at that all right so getting in here you can see that this dashboard is the original one of the car and it is very weathered we have huge cracks about the size of the grand canyon throughout i mean we probably have 10 or so cracks throughout here now it is possible to go in here and probably fix these cracks, but either way, you've got to pull the dashboard out. I figured if I'm going to go through all that work, I might as well just put one that's already ready to go in here. So I think this new dashboard will really help turn the interior of this car around and it'll only be made better when we finally get the seats recovered and everything like that. But this dashboard is just one of those things that will just always look off as long as these cracks are here. So I think overall the $175 that I spent on a dashboard that doesn't have any cracks on it will really help shave years off the age of this car just by having an uncracked dashboard present. Now yanking out a dashboard on a car usually isn't something for the faint of heart. It isn't my first time ever pulling a dashboard out of a car. I've actually had to pull the dashboard out of my 1993 300ZX Twin Turbo over here once before because I had to replace the heater core in it, which was leaking. And that dashboard was a huge pain to do. I don't expect the E30 to be quite as bad, but it's still going to be a little bit of finicky work just getting in there, getting all those clips undone, finding all those hidden bolts, and moving wires out of the way, and making sure nothing breaks in the process. So I'm hoping I can do this dashboard swap without introducing squeaks or rattles coming from the front end of the car. Sometimes that's a result of messing with the dashboard, but I'm just hoping that won't happen this time. But anyway, that's enough talk. Let's go ahead and pull the old dashboard dashboard out.
Okay, so I've got the old dashboard out of the car, but before we start installing the new one, let's take a look at some of the hangups I encountered along the way. Okay, so looking inside of here, it just looks absolutely crazy. We've got wires going everywhere, and just, it doesn't even look like I could possibly put this thing back together. It just looks like an absolute mess. But, everything went reasonably okay as far as the disassembly goes, until I got to the driver's side corner over here while I was trying to pull the dashboard out. The problem arose because of this wiring loom right here, which consists of probably six different looms. It was wrapped around one of the HVAC vents so that the dashboard couldn't actually be pulled out because without getting these wires back around the HVAC system, it just couldn't be extracted. So what I ended up having to do is, if we just take a look at the old dashboard here, I had to pull off this defrost ducting that went to the driver's side. I just had to kind of push that out of there and I was able to pull those wires out that were running over the top of this. It's really a strange system because it was going between these two ducts, the whole wiring harness. Now, when I go to install the new one, I'm hopefully not even gonna have to route it in between these two ducts. Hopefully I can just route it below everything. That way I can just slide the dashboard over the top of everything. At least that's the route I'm going to try to do because that will significantly decrease the amount of work needed to put the new dashboard in. A similar sort of thing was occurring on the passenger side as well the speaker wire was going between these two ducts and I actually had to take the speaker out, pull the connectors off the speaker and then route the, it's just a small two wire loom back through everything so I could pull out the passenger side of the dashboard. The secondary issue that I had to work around when pulling the old dashboard out was the steering column here. So all the write-ups I've seen say that you don't need to mess with any of this steering column setup to get the dashboard out over the top. Well, the truth is I did have to mess with this. I had to unbolt the windshield wiper switch and the cruise control mechanism so that the dashboard can slide out over the top. It was still a very tight fit even getting this out, but if I hadn't moved these switch gear over, I mean, I probably would have ended up breaking something. So I'm glad I decided to remove that stuff. Let's see, the third thing here, these A-pillar covers are just kind of a little bit mangled. I think once the dashboard's put back in here, here, you won't see a lot of these marring marks. I mean, it's just, I don't know how you get these things out of here without causing a little bit of damage. It's not significant, but it doesn't look great at the same time. So hopefully with a new dashboard in there, it doesn't really stand out. The last point of note when taking the old dashboard out is these ceiling gaskets made of this, some sort of insulating foam that goes around here to where the dashboard vents mount to the heater box. This stuff is just old and crumbly. As you can see, it's all deteriorated. So you definitely want to replace all of this when you're going in here and doing this. I've gone in here and removed all the old residue from the insulation that was here. I've used some brake parts cleaner and to clean up all the old sticky residue on here. Then I went to the hardware store and got this half inch wide uh, window stripping, weather stripping type stuff. It has an adhesive backing and I just stuck it on here, you know, as good as I could. It's not perfect, but it's going to be better than what was there and certainly better than not having any insulation there at all. So just a few observations that I had when removing this dashboard. It's uh, overall been pretty much a bear. Not nearly as easy as I thought it would be, but here's to hoping I can get the new dashboard back in here and put all the wires where they're supposed to go and get all the little bolts put back where they're supposed to go as well. So let's get to it. <laughs>
now the new dashboard is successfully in the car. However, about three weeks has elapsed since that part of the video actually occurred. And that's because a varying number of factors came into play, which mean I couldn't actually complete the video in line with when I actually finished the dashboard. The weather turned to crap, it snowed, it iced, it got really cold, I couldn't do anything outside. And then on top of that, the car started developing a running issue. Well, not exactly a running issue, a non-running issue. The car would just randomly die when it was idling. And then I'd go to start it back up and it would cough into life and then immediately die again. Now it just coincidentally, all of that started happening when I was changing the dashboard. It was not actually related to the dashboard at all. So after doing a lot of diagnosis, I found out that the fuel pump was starting to die. So I replaced the fuel pump and I also replaced the fuel pressure regulator that sits on top of the fuel rail, just because those were the two parts in the fuel system that I haven't touched yet. And I figured I might as well just go in throw new parts at it, and hopefully I'll not encounter any more fueling issues. It was about $150 all in to install those parts, so not too bad of a spin to ensure that this car won't just randomly die on me when I'm not expecting it. So thankfully, I'm happy to say that we finally got a decent day occurring over here. It's been raining off and on, but the sun is shining, and actually, it's not too cold out here. It's uh, probably mid-50s, and it feels like a heat wave compared to what it was before. So let's take a look at all the changes that have occurred on this car, including the new dashboard. So in here, under this cover is where the fuel pump exists, and I've gone ahead and replaced that. I don't have any video of that, but it's actually a pretty simple procedure. You just undo a fuel line, undo a electrical, two electrical connectors, you pull out the fuel sending unit, and then you use a punch and a hammer to drive the fuel pump in a twisting action out of the tank, and then you just kind of and angle it out of that little opening and it comes out. Not too difficult of an issue. And again, I was able to get off of Amazon a new fuel pump for about $100 or so ship. And it looks of high quality. I think it was a Spectra brand. And so far the car runs really well. It starts up much quicker now and the idle's a lot smoother. In fact, when you blip the throttle, there's no more dip or lag or anything inside it related to that. So I think the fuel pump was going out the whole time and it just finally got to the point where it was not gonna work anymore. Now, unfortunately, in the process of replacing this fuel pump, I actually damaged the fuel sending unit. So this car has two fuel level sending units, one on the driver's side, one on the passenger side. And unfortunately, when I was pulling that one out, I somehow damaged it and it doesn't work anymore. Now, looking around, I tried to find a used one that I could just throw back in here for cheap, but apparently those are all drying up. I went to three salvage yards, couldn't find one single fuel sending unit for this side that goes inside of the fuel pump assembly. So I might just have to bite the bullet and buy a brand new one. I think they're about $200. All the used ones I've seen on like eBay and such, they want $100, $120. And it's like, why would I pay more than half the price of a new one for an old one that's probably going to break pretty soon anyways. So eventually I'll probably have to put in a new fuel sender unit because right now my fuel gauge says nothing. It says it's empty. And of course, I know that's not true. Okay, so the fuel pump has been installed. Let's go take a look at the engine bay. Okay, so in here, this is our fuel pressure regulator. I replaced that with a new one and I think it really smoothed out the running of the engine. I don't know if the old one was necessarily bad, but this one is new and I can trust it for a long time to come. So anything related to the fuel system that I can trust is a good thing. I think it was about $50. I got it locally actually from an auto parts store because I'm pretty sure it's one that's used across many different models, not just these E30s. So that's the fuel system stuff that I've had to deal with in the time span of installing the dashboard and dealing with all this weather issue. Now let's take a look at the dashboard. That's right, this thing is like a whole different car from the inside now. No more cracks, everything fits back together perfectly just as I'd expect. Now I know I said in my suspension installation video that I'd do a driving video to see how the new suspension is performing on this car. So I decided let's just go ahead and do that right now. We've got some good weather going on. Of course it might, it might rain on us while we're going, but that'll be okay. So let's get down and take a drive.
major thing I've noticed with the new suspension in this car is it doesn't rattle or knock anymore. I mean, you hit a bump and there's no none of those high-pitched jink kind of noises. It's just it's just solid, you know. It's very direct through the steering. Now, my first drive test video that I did, I said that the steering was very direct, and that was because I didn't have any reference point to how it should feel. But with all the renewed bushings and sway bar links and control arms, including the new springs and Bilstein shocks, now I know what direct feeling should feel like. And this car is tight. So I was able to take the car to get an alignment uh, a few weeks ago. And there's a shop in town that specializes in race cars, uh, track builds, they do roll cages and everything, including uh, precision laser alignments, and that's exactly what this car needed. You know, whenever you go and take a car to alignment, especially a specialist car that has some modifications done to it, you have to describe the situation. So for example, in this car, it has the adjustable eccentric trailing arm bushings. So I went to them and I said, well, the rear end needs an alignment. And I didn't even need to explain what's going on back there. They already knew, they know E30s, and they're like, all right, so it's got eccentric bushings back there. And I'm like, yes, it does. And they're like, okay, we'll do it. And we'll do the front end and, and get it all squared up for you. And I gotta say, they did an excellent job. They also balanced the wheels while it was there because they were a little bit rumbly on the highway. So now that's all taken care of. I mean, just everything's so much more secure feeling when driving this car. Everything, not just the steering, but just the way the car responds to every input you make, every shift you make. It doesn't wallow as much. On and off the throttle, you don't feel like the suspension's moving around. You don't feel like the wheels are changing wheelbase anymore. It's just a much more solid car. Dare I say, it almost feels like brand new. I guess that's what you get when you spend $1,400 on suspension. I guess it makes sense that it would feel brand new, but it really is just hard to describe until you've just felt it. Felt the difference between an old 200,000 plus mile suspension system compared to a brand new performance suspension system. Now, I wish there was a way that I could go out and really tear up some corners in this car, but again, I live in Kansas, and if there's one thing we don't have, it's curvy roads. About as good as we get are highway on-ramps and off-ramps, and I have taken some of those, and the car just tracks so well. I mean, mid-turn, when you hit a bump, it doesn't feel like you're gonna go flying off into the ditch. It just absorbs the bump and holds the line you were going on to begin with. And if you give it more throttle, it just digs in. You can tell that rear end just has all the grip in the world. And I attribute that mostly because there's not so much negative camber in the back. There's still a few degrees back there going on, but we don't have an excessive amount. The tire is contacting the ground as much as possible. So we look here, there's my fuel gauge not working. I'm going off of the old tried and true method of using my trip odometer to know how much gasoline I have. Assuming I'm not just leaking it out somewhere with only 83 miles, I should have at least half a tank left. So I will say, without the rear seat installed in the car, there is more road noise. You can actually hear a little bit the fuel pump and and uh, just some of the rear tire noise just because that rear seat does absorb quite a lot of sound. And I don't have it installed right now and it's just kind of letting in all of the noise. But none of it's suspension noise, which is exactly what I was hoping for. fuel pump it just idles so much more smoothly so before it had a little bit of a hiccup I wouldn't call it a misfire but I would say there was a little bit of a fuel delivery issue that didn't allow it to just hold a really nice idle but now with that new fuel pump I mean it just delivers it punches starting to come together. It's almost a complete package. Really, it's just the interior that needs some assistance. Again, I'm working on it. Right now, it's got these nasty looking seat covers and then no seat. 
And then eventually I'll have to find a way to fix this steering wheel. I mean, the cover's not terrible, but it does leave something to be desired because it's obviously a cover. I did get a quote from a company to have it recovered and they do really good work. They even have some of these M-Tech 1 steering wheels as examples of ones they've recovered. But they quoted me $500 to redo it. So now I'm wondering, well, maybe there's someone who can do it cheaper or maybe I should just try to do it myself because uh, $500 is kind of steep. Yeah, there's just no way that's gonna happen. So after installing the dashboard, I'm just really happy to report everything electronically works aside from the fuel gauge, but again, not related to the dashboard swap. Everything went back together. Nothing's loose or rattly. I mean, even all the little lights that should illuminate like in the ashtray here and in the glove box, everything still works. I tried to put everything back as it was. So I think that worked out pretty well. I will say in this sort of damp ground type environment, you can really start to appreciate that limited slip differential. Even in a fairly low powered car like this 325i, going around a sharp turn when there's not all the available traction possible from the ground, you can really appreciate knowing that both wheels will continue spinning should traction be lost and let you control any sort of slide that happens. I have kicked this thing out just in some mild slides and it, it's just completely controllable and dare I say quite fun to do it. Now the differential I did install is the 410 one which means the, the engine revs a bit higher than the previous differential which was a 373 open differential but I think it wakes up this car quite a bit. It puts the engine and the power band much faster. It does render first gear kind of useless because it's so short, but you can start in second gear kind of like a big diesel truck and this car does just fine with that. Now I'm sure if you had a full car with five people in it, you might start using first gear to get you up and going, but honestly I use second gear right now and it works great. On the highway turning about 70, 75, we are knocking on the door of almost 4,000 RPM, so it does kind of get singy up there at highway speeds, but I don't really plan to do too much commuting in this car, so that should be okay. Yeah, this new suspension just really turns this car into more of a go-kart than it ever was. normal around town speed limit is 45 miles an hour and it means I can just drop it into fifth gear and it has no problem just kind of lugging around at 45 50 miles an hour with that new gear ratio in fact in about an indicated 50 miles an hour we're sitting at about 2100 rpm in fifth gear and you can just leave it in fifth gear and it pulls plenty fine What are my thoughts on spending $1,400 to completely refresh the suspension on this car? Well, ultimately, it certainly was worth the money. Now, I did go the more expensive route, going with the Bilstein V8 shock absorbers, but ultimately, it was only a difference of maybe two or $300 compared to what standard shock absorbers you were to get. So really, it would have cost me about $1,000 anyways to do this. So I think going ahead and putting the higher end Bilstein shocks in here was definitely worthwhile. The ride hasn't really been affected as far as comfort. It still absorbs cracks and expansion joints in the road just fine. It doesn't jostle the car around when you hit a pothole. It still performs just like a good road car. However, when you start to get into a, a big turn, a high speed turn, that's where these shocks really come into their own. So would I recommend someone who's looking to upgrade their suspension on their E30 to go the more expensive route? Yes, I certainly would. Just a nice smooth idle, just above 500 RPM, which I believe exactly where it should be. And hopefully with spending the 200 or $220, I can get my gas gauge to work again. It's just, it's a small little thing that most cars don't, you don't even think about. But when you don't have a functioning gas gauge, you're like, ah, how much gas is really in the tank. I mean, you can use the trip odometer, but that's just an estimation at best. So, I mean, it's a lot of money to spend for a small bit of functionality, but that's the sort of thing that makes a project car into a usable car.
All right, so that's all I'm gonna be doing for this video. So as you can see, I've got another project going on here in the garage, it's my wife's car. It needs to have all of the supposed lifetime fluids changed out because we're gonna be taking this on a road trip here soon. I just want it to be sure it's gonna be good to go. It's got about 95,000 miles, so it's certainly time to have everything switched out from the transmission to brake fluid to coolant to power steering fluid, it just needs to be done. So even though I'm not working on the E30 right now, I'm always working on something in the Practical Enthusiast Garage. And it just so happens that we're doing something a little bit more mundane, like a Mazda 3. Anyway, once I get this done, hopefully we can get back to the E30, do some more projects on that, so I can get more videos to you guys on that project. So with that, I'd like to thank you for tuning in this time, and we'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.